Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 29 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. I am your host, Jason A. Meiske, and hey, I hope you enjoyed last week's episode uh, where, you know, we just took a little bit of time, I guess we took the whole episode, to be honest, and we just reminisced about uh, 26 authors, and, you know, that's, that's 26 authors, 26 sample chapters, and it, w- it was a nice time. I had a really good time. I hope you did. Uh, looking at the numbers, it seems like uh, people enjoyed going back and getting a little sample of it, and I hope you went back and got to listen to maybe some authors that you didn't hear before. But uh, now... We're on the road to another another big collection of uh, authors. We have another round of authors. I got several of them recorded, including today's guest. But first, gotta say thank you to Podcast Garden. They are our host site for this show and many many others like us. If you are looking for other shows, you can check them out at podcastgarden.com and find other podcasts with a variety of subjects. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. It, it, if you're looking for it, they got it. Also, if you're interested in starting your own podcast, you don't want to go any further than PodcastGarden.com. You can start it off for that first month for free. Check it out, PodcastGarden.com. Hey, I also want to thank you, Storall. They are the premier location in the Warrensburg area for self-storage. Whether it's conventional or climate control, the entire facility is fenced in, gated access, and more than 40 cameras recording 24 hours a day. It is a clean and safe location. Look no further than U Store All of Warrensburg, Missouri. That is the letter U S T O R A L L. And check them out online at ustoreall.net. So, in this upcoming episode, uh, my guest, uh, his name is Daniel L. Naden. And he writes a lot of horror and suspense. And we kind of we get a, a minute where we talk about the importance of reviews. Now, I've talked about it a lot on the show. And I thought it was great that he took a moment to talk about reviews. And he said something really important, you know, and it's that uh, as a writer, he's not worried about what kind of a review it is. He just wants to hear about it. And and that's true, I think, for most authors. You know, we've got thick skin. We want to know what you really think. So if you like the story, great. Absolutely. That's fantastic. But if you didn't like it, if there was something about the story you didn't like, still leave a review. A lot of authors will still read that. We learn from that. Reviews are so important. So, and and that goes, you know, for <laughs> goes for podcasts too. So, if you, I mean, if you find a book out there that you like, if it wasn't maybe your cup of tea, if it was, you know, something was strange about it, you know, go ahead and leave a review and say what you're thinking. Say what what it was about this book that. You know, like, eh, you know, this part was just a little, hmm, you know, one of my favorite books. There's a part in it that I just don't like. I, I really don't like. There's a part in it that just takes me out, you, you know, and it doesn't matter whether I'm listening to the audiobook or reading it myself, you know, either version. Actually, two of my favorite books have a part in there that just takes me out of the experience. And, you know, I said so in my reviews. It still doesn't take away from the fact that I love the book. Yeah, it's important. So make sure if you find a book that you like, if you find a book that was okay, if you find a book that you didn't like, make sure you go on there and leave a review on Amazon or wherever it is that you you found it. If you picked up a book at a convention somewhere, make sure you, uh, I think it's, it's really good to go ahead and mention on there that, hey, I met this author. They signed a copy for me. I got this book. I, you know, it was okay. You know, or it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I'm going to keep this book forever. You know, it's those personal little touches like that that I think the authors really like. And I think other people really like, too, because it it makes it personal and it makes it something that's real. Don't forget to leave a review. Before we get over to our interview this week, I have a very special message coming to you about an upcoming event in Kansas City. You don't want to miss this. friends, Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a minute and share with you a very special event coming to Kansas City September 6th and 7th. It's called the Show Me Your Books KC Convention. With a mix of 60, yes, I said 60, traditionally published and any authors, 
in attendance, you don't want to miss this amazing two-day event. Can't go to both days? That's all right. Because you're going to get in for free on Saturday from noon to three to meet and greet the authors. You can pick up their books, get your picture with them. But keep in mind, if you only do that, you're going to miss out on the VIP experience. Get your special VIP tickets online at the ShowMeYourBooksKC.com website, and you'll be part of the Friday kickoff with dessert and drinks and a beer and barbecue later. Also, you'll get to have breakfast with the authors Saturday morning, followed by a one-hour VIPs-only time slot with the authors. Later Saturday night, there's a 1920s-themed farewell ball. You don't want to miss out on that. Best part about the whole thing, you know, books aside, authors aside, best part is that Show Me Your Books KC has partnered with the Dream Factory and created a raffle that runs throughout the event. All proceeds go towards helping Dream Factory that makes dreams come true for terminally and chronically ill children. Go to showmeyourbookskc.com for more information or follow the links in the show notes. Now back to your show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Today, I am have the great pleasure of sitting down with Daniel L. Naden. Uh, did I say your name right? Is it Naden? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> Daniel. It's, it's one of those tr- uh, tricky names that you look at it and you think, that's not going to sound, That's gonna, it's not Naden, it's got to be something else. Uh, <laughs> so we get that a lot, you know, it's like. You say that and people go, oh, it's just like it's spelled. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. There you go. Yeah. It, I mean, it's 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 simple. It's a much better than my name where you look at mine and you're like, wait a minute. What is that last name? So, so, yeah. Daniel, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I'm a, a, a writer uh, in some capacity. Uh, I kind of have this in my bio, I guess, but in some capacity, I feel like I've always been a writer. Uh, I've always kind of been stuck with... Um, with the you know, with kind of getting hit with a, a, a curious what if that um, my brain then says okay then this is this is an interesting fact what what if what what would happen to make this little fact actually be true and I realize even from when I was very little that my you know my, that's kind of how how my brain works is it just you know sees an idea and then you know, sees how a story would spit out from you know, spill out from it and and you know the chain of events, or or how a world would evolve, revolve around it, or evolve around it to be make it, you know, make it true and interesting. Um, so you know, even from when I was really little, I had you know had you know had would would get ideas like that. And you know, as I, I as I grew up, I kind of realized that I had a, a tendency to um, to actually want to want to write these down. Um, you know, it was blessed with a, a gift for you know, for using words and and uh, yeah, using like written words maybe not so much spoken word but um, using written words and and um, kind of hear, uh, being able to hear how they sound right to me so uh, it's a I guess it's a good combination with that uh, that other gift great yeah and, and I mean, and you kind of like jumped right into uh, it was a nice uh, lead way into my next question about finding that inspiration. You're just kind of collecting your inspirations from everywhere, uh, from life in general. Something can trigger something with you the, for the stories that you write. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, sometimes it's it's, you know, sometimes it's uh, more of a uh, of a uh, of a structured thing that I think, oh, yeah, that'd be kind of an interesting you know, story similar to something else, some other story or movie or something that I've watched, or there's some aspect of it that's there. But quite often, it's a uh, uh, just a little thing that strikes me weird. Um, as an example, I had one of my earliest stories is uh, one. It almost ended up like po- poetry when I wrote it out. It's a story called Footsteps, and at the time I was working in downtown Kansas City was uh, walking back from lunch and they've got the downtown has of course the sidewalks and then they've got the uh, you know the big grates over the the steam vents and, and, and tunnels underneath and I was walking and I could hear somebody's footsteps behind me and I walked across the gate and uh, the grate and I could hear their footsteps when they hit the grate and I thought you know that's kind of weird if some if I was running from somebody hearing the change in how my feet sound and how their feet sound when they hit the grate 
gives me a perception of how close they are. And out of this, then times it comes this whole idea of somebody's run running and they can hear they, you know, they're, they're so afraid they can't even look back, but they can hear that somebody's catching up to them and, and that they're getting closer and they, they hit leaves in the path or whatever. And then they hear the other footsteps hit the leaves and they know that they're getting closer and closer and closer. And the story footstep just kind of came out of that. And it's just off of just a little weird thing that hits hit, that hit me. It's like, that's kind of odd. You know, you, so, so, so what would that be? How would that, how would that work in a, in a story? How would that work? you know, work in the world or how to, how would that apply, you know, in some way that would be, you know, that, 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 that you know, how could I make that be interesting in some way? Oh, that's really cool. My, my wife for Christmas this year, she got me one of those little, um, notebooks for the shower with the, yeah. <laughs> with the waterproof pad. And yeah. uh, I kind of laughed about it, but, uh, it didn't take me very long before I was like, Oh, I got this idea. I need to go take a shower real quick so I can write it down. Which, which is a little odd to think of it that way, but now I'm kind of I'm running out of pages because I'll get these funny little things while I'm showering and I gotta stop and and uh, do that. Which not not the best idea for water conservation. I'm I'm I tend to take longer showers than I used to, but uh. yeah. Yeah, when I when I uh, first started out, um, well, when I first started out, I I was a horrible typist, uh, you know, a horrible typist in high school and and through college. Where you know I'm old enough to uh, have had to type all my college papers on on a typewriter, uh, on actual <laughs> yeah. typewriters rather than on computers, um, and and so uh, I, most of my writing I did I did longhand, and I, I would get ideas you know at work or you know at school or whatever I'd get ideas and I would just jot them down in the margins of pages and and I've got you know I've got a, a box that is just packed full of, of tightly handwritten scroll that's probably illegible uh, uh, of, of ideas or stories that I was uh, story ideas that I was writing out that at some point I you know hopefully I'll have time to uh, cycle back around and and look at those again you know decades you know later and and see you know see what my, where my brain was then see what the idea if, if any ideas are are worth transcribing but yeah now pretty much you know if I'm not on my home computer where I've got my, uh, my in progress or concept folders, I, uh, will just open an email and start an email and save it as a draft. And so I've got story ideas to email drafts that, uh, where I just jot it down because I, you know, I work in computers. I'm on a computer all day and I don't want to spend all day writing out, you know, at work, uh, writing out ideas. So I'll just jot a few sentences and leave it at that just so that I won't forget what, what the idea was. So, <laughs> Nothing's worse than going. Okay, I had this really cool idea. Right. Okay, what was it now? You know. So. Yeah, and then you just email that to yourself. Uh, yeah, or I just leave it as a draft. So then when I put pull it up, I, I uh, don't even have to have have it sent. I just go look in the save draft folder, <laughs> and and it's there. Oh, that's I'll awesome. Copy paste it to to my in progress folder, and then and try to make back make sure I get backups of my my home computer. You know that of that. Or my writing folder, so that if the computer dies, that I don't lose, uh, you know, lose everything I've ever written. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! I'll have to keep that in mind. That's a, that's a fantastic idea. So, and we were talking before the show about uh, speaking of, of like working and being really busy. I mean, you, you're a very busy guy yourself, and how how do you make the time to to write? I mean, is it just kind of fitting it in the cracks during the day, or do you have writing time at night? Um, it's mainly just trying to fit it, fit it into the cracks. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get hit with, uh, you know, get, get hit with a really hot idea or hot notion. And, and then it, it's like, you know, everything else gets, you know, pushed aside because I've got it right. I and mean, when I finally hit the right vibe on parting shot, that was, um, pretty much every night then for, you know, for weeks and, and weeks to try to get it finished up for uh, originally it was going to be a submission for a novella uh contest and uh I, I didn't make it in it didn't make it in there and so i i probably had ended up rewriting the either the whole thing or doing you know, major passes through you know major alterations through it maybe six or seven times over the course of uh, a few years before i finally was able to get it into a neat format and get it published uh so 
you know, it's just kind of a matter of, of whenever I find the time and, and making sure that I match up when I feel motivated, you know, and, and feel strongly that I'm ready to write, uh, making sure I get that matched up with, uh, you know, having my computer open and my, uh, my word processor open and, and ready to, uh, to, to start writing on whatever it is that I'm writing on. That's great. And uh, while you're talking about it then, so Parting Shot was your most recent novel. Tell us, uh, tell the audience about, about Parting Shot. So Parting Shot is set, it's a, it's a zombie story. It's set uh, 10 years beyond the end of the apocalypse. Um, the, um, the zombie plague as it hit, uh, it was a fairly fast moving one. And so, um, you know, you know, people turn, you know, turn pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, the people who weren't exposed were able to, to stay away. So there were, you know, pockets, large pockets of people that survived, but over time, because it still was, was a fast moving plague over time, uh, those pockets would fall apart and everywhere people would gather, more pockets would fall apart. So society and the world just kind of collapsed. And it's all parting shot is told from the story, the perspective of Brian, uh, who is, uh, the guy who survived most of those 10 years pretty much just on his own as a loner who tried in, in with various groups to very, various amounts of luck, but pretty much decided that he needed to be on, on his own. And instead he, you know, about the time that, that he realized that he in, falls in with another group of people and they kind of find a new way, maybe not a new way, but, start to find a little bit of hope and ways of surviving, uh, making surviving more than just living day after day of actually, you know, living for the future uh, and, you know, how, whatever that future might be. Well, that's, that sounds really interesting. I like that. Uh, and what, um, so, and, and what are you working on now? Uh, I'm working on a story called Allure. Uh, it is, uh, it's, going to be a full-length novel, whereas Parting Shot's more uh, novella-length. Um, uh, Allure is um, uh, it's covering uh, you know, the main character who is um, uh, discovered, um, well, he kind of is something that happened to him where um, if he comes into physical contact with, with, with somebody, if he touches you, then his body immediately starts putting out pheromones to draw anybody else nearby, like strong pheromones to draw them towards him. But anybody he touches, they get, they get a, a nasty plague and will die very quickly. And so people are drawn to him and he's killing them as well. And uh, it's kind of um, a, 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 like, uh, well, the, we, we find out later on in the story that, that these are chemicals that are being used to, to breed warrior, you know, warriors of, of different types of skills, just layers of warriors. But uh, at this point in my writing, I haven't really uh, fleshed that out, uh, you know, too deeply, I guess. Uh, but it, it, the character is um, on his own and is uh, trying to, um, he, he's on the run uh, at, because it, uh, every time he has, it just even if it's just a minor you know, minor touch, then, you know, he creates kind of a, a, a panic around himself and, you know, he has to get away as quickly as possible because the more people who pick up the pheromones that are in the air from him, the more, uh, the, the, uh, the more people who will touch him and die. And, and it just kind of makes it worse and worse as it goes. So he, he's on the run and is being sought after not only by, you know, the police, but also by uh, people from this corporation that have created these pheromones that he, you know, this, the, these drugs that uh, turned him into what he is because they're trying to get him back under control. They didn't realize that he, uh, that, that, that he was in, infected with them. Oh, wow. That sounds fascinating. Is this going to be like part of a series? I, I hope so. Uh, I have to be able to finish this first book uh, to, <laughs> to get there. And it's been one that I've been working on for a while, kind of, um, and stuck on one of the one of the chapters, uh, but um, uh, like I said, I, I I was telling you earlier, I, I think this one is going to be a. Uh, I, I think I'm kind of getting past that. It's one of those things that it was wasn't an easy fix. Sometimes you roadblock and you kind of step back and you're like, well, throw that out and we'll start over. And then you then you pick up the right vibe and you go. And 
this one has just been a slow slog to, to get past this little little roadblock, but uh, I think I'm slowly working through it, and then I'll be able to uh, to jump on and, and hopefully get a, get get more traction and get get more words into it. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, you'll have to let us know when that comes out so we can uh, make sure and share that on on the uh, the web page and Facebook and Twitter that we've got set up. So we'll. Uh... Make sure and put that out there as well. And, and you know, uh, well, and I guess while I'm at it here too, we should go ahead and, and let the audience know you got uh, you were in an anthology, uh, best of horror library, and uh, which was a collection from another horror library that you were in, where they grabbed your story from the one and, and put it in this best of. Which that's awesome. How did that happen? Um, well, uh, I you know. I've been writing for a long time, uh, and uh, about the time I was really starting, and I'm going to do a little bit of a backstory on you, so sorry for the digression. <laughs> about the time I started really getting serious with, with writing was uh, the time that uh, the internet was kind of exploding, and, and the newest, greatest thing were uh, online e-zines, e-magazines, and everybody had one, and they were all over the place, and they were going to like re- replace traditional publishing, except that. Um, like we see so often today, even on Amazon, when there's so much content out there, there's no way of actually drawing people in. I mean, even with you know, with uh, you know, network, you know, people networking together, everybody pretty much just wants to bring everybody to their e-zine where their stories are, so that they can read their stories, and nobody wants to go to somebody else's and read, read theirs. So, it, you know, there was just way too much content there. But out of that, I made. A lot of connections with good writers and kind of step after step I ended up in the uh, horror library which started out kind of as a uh, as a um, an, an e-zine but also a collection of writers and so it was a writing group it was uh, um, they had a lot of extremely talented writers some of the, the best independent writers that I've I, I've, I've, I've read uh, even today um, uh, you came through the, the horror library group when they started publishing anthologies. Um, they had a really good editor in, in Frank Hutton who was, he made sure that they weren't just producing schlock or they weren't you know, you know they weren't just doing vanity press. We'll just put your story out there just so you can say you had it in print. I mean they were you know he was 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 pretty tough, pretty exacting, but it, it made sure that the quality of the, the anthologies were coming out were, were really well. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, have, when I wrote Drawn, it actually appeared first in um, Dark Recesses Press magazine, and uh, Horror Library asked if I would submit it for their Volume 2 anthology, um, and, and I was able to make it in, the, you know, make it in there as a uh, republished from, from Dark Recesses Press, and um, you know, then it it sat for a while. They were up to volume five of their anthology, and then um, a, even more time passed, and they came back and did a, a best of, and they asked to uh, put my story in there and uh, uh, several of the others. They were able to get um, even get Bentley Little to uh, contribute a couple different stories to uh, various anthologies that they had. So they really, Horror Library was really building up a, a lot of good momentum over the years and, uh, and over the course of the their different anthologies. So it was I kind of was got there by networking through a lot of different places and making connections online. And, and it was a uh, really kind of a good way to get my, my foot in the door for, uh, for a place where they're doing really quality writing. Absolutely. Holy cow. That's fantastic, man. I feel really lucky. Well, where can people find you? I, uh, well, uh, Parting Shop is on, uh, is for sale on Amazon. It's available through Hellbound Publishing Books. Um, and, uh, so you, you, they've got links there for, uh, Amazon and Goodreads. And, um, uh, it's also available in ebooks as, uh, for the, the, the Nook. It's available, of course, through Amazon, uh, on the Kindle. And it's also a, a paperback version. Um, uh, so, so you can find it there. Um, my uh, author page is Daniel L. Naden author. It's on on Facebook, um, and then on Twitter, uh, it's also uh, uh, okay. I'm gonna have to sorry. G- give me just a minute. I'm gonna have to look it up because I, I can't remember <laughs> specifically what my Twitter author name. That's kind of shameful, I guess. But oh, that's all right. It, it might <laughs> as a show. 
uh, and and even me for myself. This is the, my first time on Twitter just in the last couple of weeks, and I I'm still learning what I'm doing on Twitter. I, I don't have any idea half the time. So <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, so yeah, I'm you know available in I guess all the, the usual places. If you're looking for product party shot on on uh, Amazon or Goodreads, uh, I just look for party shot by Daniel Naden. Um, and that'll take you right to it. Like I said, you can buy the, uh, the paperback or the Kindle version. And if you buy it and you read it, or if you know you read, you know, if if you read it from somewhere, um, contributor copy or or whatever, uh, you know, please leave a uh, please leave me a, a review. You know, I kind of self-serving, I guess, but I'm, I'm one of those uh, one of those people who I really want to hear what people have to say if they like it, if they don't. It, doesn't really matter to me. I, I think any feedback is, is good, and you know you can't really get better as an author unless you, you get the feedback. And you know reviews are always kind of kind of tricky because people don't want to say bad things about an author, or they you know or they you know, they really like it, and they're like, well, you know, you know I'm just not comfortable leaving reviews. But hmm. that's kind of ends up being an author's can be an, an author's life bread. You know they. Uh, you know, at, on Amazon, I know that like if you get 25 reviews, then you at, you get bumped up into a different category of advertising, and Amazon will start actually promoting your book through mm. through its ads or through its search engines. So, you know, there are levels that you that you, that are it's important to hit, even if the reviews are good or bad, but just by certain numbers of book uh, of reviews. But more to the point, I guess, like I said before, I really want to hear. I really want to hear what people think about my writing, and it, I don't really uh, doesn't really I don't really care if, if somebody hates it and you know they think it's the worst thing ever or they don't like uh, the puns in the book at the start uh, or whatever it is. I, I want to hear it because I like I said I you know I, I can't get better unless I, I find out what what it is not only what what's working well for for people for readers but also what what they think is stupid uh, and uh, you know I. You, you, like I say, you can't get better if you don't if you don't learn. Absolutely, no, I I agree with you 100, percent and that's one of the things on this show. Uh, you know, the the listeners that are coming back every week, they hear me talk a lot about, you know, please go on and leave a review for these authors. You know, if you, if you like the story from this author, leave a review. You know, and if they wouldn't mind, they can say that they heard about it from the from the show. The review um, on somebody's book, that's the bread and butter. That's that's uh, you know that can make our day and it can also make us better, and yeah, absolutely, I agree completely. All right, well, Daniel, I this has been great, man. I'm so happy to have uh, have heard about you through a friend and and then got a chance to reach out to you. And I mean, I'm glad this came together like it did. Uh, you know, I look forward to uh, you know keeping up with you and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, yeah maybe I can get you back on here again one of these days and uh, we'll talk about oh yeah I remember back when you wrote Parting Shot yeah that was <laughs> <laughs> well I, I really appreciate uh, yeah really appreciate appreciate you uh, you know coming to find me and uh, and asking me to be on the show because uh, like I, I mean it's I'm, I'm really honored to to be on here uh, I mean you you run a, a really good uh, a really good show here and. Uh, I, I mean, it's just really cool to be here. It's been really nice talking with you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Danny. It's, it's completely my pleasure, man. Well, hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand the floor over to Daniel Naden with Parting Shot. Parting Shot, Chapter 1, The Yard. The shoe was on the other foot, but the foot had become detached and was currently holding the intense interest of the zombie near the shed. Another zombie, one with a rather significant overbite, had wormed his way through the abdominal wall and got himself a mouthful of intestines. The overbite, however, kept his teeth from cutting cleanly. Now he was hopelessly tangled in what could only be described as a gutsy web of shit. A different knot of zombies must have, in their living lives, heard the old leper jokes. Some were doing their deal-level best at trying to face off in the corner. Another unfortunate undead dude who lost his poker face was about ready to throw in his hand. His heart was definitely in the game, but he simply could not keep his head on the task at hand, or his hand at task. From the depths of the shadow cast by the eaves, looming over the backyard deck, I'd watched the undead tuck into Stein, where they cornered him against the, against the fence. When the first of them pushed into the backyard, I tried to hold him back to keep him from breaking cover, 
You heard them rattling up against the fence latch or the creak of the hinge as they forced their way through the gate. Saw them shamble around the corner of the house and just about shit himself. They got close to us and Stein lunged away from me. I caught a fistful of his collar, but he twisted and shrugged out of it. Left me with nothing but shirt off his back, literally, as he tore across the yard. I have the slightest idea in hell what he thought he was going to do. Maybe he figured he could bull through them at the gate and escape to the wide open streets. But he knew, or should have known, that that wide open doesn't exist anymore. There were just too many of these fuckers in the world. So I don't know what happened. Stein was scared and just panicked, I guess. Or maybe after all this time, it finally got to him. The running, the fighting, the hiding, the slow starvation, the loss of friends, the horror of watching the world die one mouthful at a time. He ran. At first, it looked like he might get lucky and find a gap between the first group of three or four that were already in the yard and whatever others might be following. His luck, however, wasn't luck at all. Stein rounded the corner and bounced off the chest of about ten more, all bunched up together in a group. He turned with a squeak, like a terrified mouse, and ran right into the waiting arms of the first group. Poor soul, I whispered. You were just too high strung. I figured the folks who made them film Tombstone wouldn't mind me stealing one of Val Kilmer's famous Doc Holliday lines, especially since all the, the movie people were either dead or eating. Brian! Stein had called out to me, only that once, but never got to finish his train of thought. One of the taller zombies took out a chunk of his throat, ripping the voice box clean out of his neck. The rest pulled him to the ground. To my reckoning, I exhibited an extreme amount of self-control. I could have thought of the requisite lump-in-the-throat joke as the mob started working in earnest on Stein, but I knew I wouldn't be able to hold out on the bad jokes forever. Stein was going, going, gone, pretty much like everyone else. I felt nothing, but I knew the proprieties must be observed, even from a quiet man on a quiet earth. And so my running commentary, my coping mechanism, took over. A twisted smile in the face of madness, laughing at the terrifying. The undead thronged to get their bit of what was possibly the next to last guy in this part of the country, perhaps even in the world. There was a shitload of them in the yard now. They formed a circle around the stein-shaped buffet bar, with the ones in front kneeling, while the others were practically climbing over the backs to get some of the good stuff. It looked like a retarded rugby scrum. I half expected Stein's liver or stomach to go squirting out across the lawn, pounced upon by some undead bastard, only to have the scrum reform again on top of him. I almost laughed out loud at the imagery. Rugby with Stein's liver, soccer with his balls. I suppose they were going to bowl with his head, too. It was funny. One of the zombies stepped away from the pile with a handful of skin or muscle or something. Most of its abdomen was gone, and I could see its spinal column through the hole. It jammed the wad into its mouth and swallowed it whole, like a dog gulping raw hamburger. But the food fell right out of its rib cage onto the ground, where the fucker proceeded to pick it up and try again, over and over. Hilarious. You can't buy comedy like this, especially these days. The giggles hit me, and I fought them hard, trying like hell to keep quiet and stay still. I was seriously in danger of laughing myself right the fuck to death. Still, the habit of self-preservation is a hard one to break. I closed my eyes and focused on breathing slowly until the giggles left me one muffled hiccup at a time. None of the zombies had noticed me yet. They couldn't see me, and I must, must have been downwind, and, well, I had gotten pretty good at standing perfectly still. Ten years, the six or seven billion undead on the planet, you figure out, out how not to be seen or heard or smelled. Right now, though, I was on the clock, and it was really just a matter of time before they found me. In a way, that clock had been running since the zombies took over the world. It's always been a matter of time. After a while, the zombies finally finished up with Stein. Usually when the dead are done eating, they just lose interest, and that's what they did here. Almost as if on cue, they stopped pressing in around his body and quit squabbling over the various pieces of him scattered across the yard. They didn't leave, though. They just began to mill about, like a candy store flash mob a couple minutes short of go. A bunch of the undead hanging around without a care in the world, but always ready in perfect position to flash or mob at just the right time, like the time when somebody loses their nerve, panics, and invites himself to dinner, or the time when somebody has a giggle fit in the shadows. In my expert opinion, that's the worst thing about the undead. They don't do anything. At least, they don't do anything unless it involves eating. So when there's nothing to eat, they just stand there, wherever they happen to be. 
kind of like middle schoolers at the first dance, hanging around hoping someone else will be brave enough to get things started. The bad part is that unlike middle schoolers, the undead aren't shy about following the leader. So if one finds you on the dance floor, so to speak, the rest will go mosh pit on your ass in a heartbeat. No wallflowers when it comes to undead dining. In my case, the zombies milling about left me in a bit of a spot. I was safe for the moment, a wallflower tucked into my friendly corner of nowhere, dark and unseen or unsmelled. Eventually, though, I'd have to move. I can stand still a long time, but not forever, and this backyard was short on exits. Just ask Stein, or at least what's left of him. The only gate in the entire perimeter of the six-foot privacy fence was guarded by a healthy horde of zombies who were still picking Stein out of their teeth. Now they had an entire eternity of hanging out with me to keep them busy, waiting for me to start the dance, I guess. I was going to have to leave sometime. The question du jour was how. And that was Daniel L. Naden reading from his zombie novella, Parting Shot. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't expecting that to have as much humor in there as it would have had, but uh, that was fantastic. Hey, make sure you follow Daniel on Amazon, on his Facebook and Twitter pages, and uh, you know, make sure to check out Parting Shot. It sounds amazing. Uh, you know, don't forget to also check out Show Me Your Books KC. The links are in the show notes. Uh, check it out online. Get your, your VIP tickets. The event's coming soon, and it's all for a good cause. Hey, until next time, you guys have a good weekend. We'll see you next week with another episode, another author, and another sample check. Bye.